A quick warning, this episode contains references to drug use. Please be advised. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. So, Matt, we've been to Taiwan, Miami, Palmer, and back. It's been quite a whirlwind. Yeah, I mean, Howard is probably our most well travelled British scandal protagonist ever. And we've covered Nick Leeson and John Darwin. He's going to have some lovely stamps in that passport, isn't he? Thinking back on the story then, how do you feel about Howard Marks, a.k.a. Narco Polo? Firstly, great nickname, so well done the DEA uh, for the pun. (laughs) Secondly, it's just such a wild ride. He's an Oxford graduate who becomes a drug baron. I mean, it's just such an escalation. And to be honest, despite myself, I couldn't help but be taken in by him as a character because his charisma and his personality... Every part of his identity, the fact that he's a softly spoken Welshman, means who would suspect him? Yes, which I suppose is one of the components of why we end up with so many people in his orbit trusting him and then getting so badly hurt by the world that he moves in. I'm thinking specifically, of course, of Judy and the kids. It's so sad to see how destructive it is to be close to somebody like that. Obviously, love is love, but from the outside, it's so hard to see why Judy would trust someone like that. And it must be so hard for Howard to keep up healthy, meaningful relationships when things can just change in an instant. Oh, to be in that couple's therapy session. Sadly, we obviously can't do that, but we can get the insight from somebody who was by Howard's side throughout his life and navigated those highs and lows. Julian Pito is a world-renowned epidemiologist and Howard Marks' lifelong friend. They met at their entrance exam to Oxford University and went on to read physics together at Balliol College. After leaving university, the pair stayed firm friends, with Julian even travelling with Howard's children to visit him in federal prison. After Howard's cancer diagnosis, Julian acted as counsel, advisor and friend throughout the remaining years of his life. Julian joins us next. On the Freakonomics Radio podcast, a special series about failure. We are surrounded by failure in relationships, in business. So why don't we learn from it? One big reason we don't learn enough from failures is that we don't share them systematically enough. So let's get systematic. How to Succeed at Failing, a new series from Freakonomics Radio. I'm going deep into my wife's family history digging up the cold case of her murdered great-grandmother. And did I mention that I'm looking into whether the murderer was actually the beloved family patriarch? Binge all episodes of Ghost Story ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Julian, welcome to British Scandal. Could you tell us about the first time you met Howard? How was that? What did you make of him? Well, it was December 1963. We were both up at Bailey were doing the entrance exams, and um, we met and clicked right away and uh, actually corresponded once or twice during the following nine months before we both actually went up in the autumn of 1964. So I met him almost exactly 60 years ago. And what was your first impression of him? Well, he was, he was a, a very remarkable <laughs> teenager. He was... Um, a local boy from a Welsh village. He was obviously extraordinarily bright. He had a, an amazing Welsh accent, which he laid on with a trowel and never attempted to modify him. He, he was perfectly capable of speaking standard English, but <laughs> never did. Um, and he was very, very amusing. I mean, very amusing, very bright, very good company. How did your relationship grow in the, in the early years at Oxford? Well, we were both doing physics at, at Balliol. We were only about eight people in a year, so we saw a lot of each other. And we, we, we were just very close friends, I mean, for, for the first two years. And then in the third year, we shared a house together. And what was Howard like as a student? Well, he, he was very bright, but he, he didn't do much work. I mean, he did a bit more than I did. But, I mean, we, we weren't very good students in that sense. But, I mean, we both finished up with reasonable seconds, rather surprisingly, considering we hadn't gone to very many lectures and... <laughs> And did he get in trouble much when he was at university? 
No, I mean, not really. I mean, we both took LSD in 1965 when it was legal, and um, the dean got to hear of us and called us in to see him. But, I mean, it was a philosophical discussion revolving around Aldous Huxley's doors of perception rather than setting off. As I said, it was, it was, it was a very curious time. And f- for those of us presenting British Scandal and, and those listening who haven't tried LSD, what was it like? My God. <laughs> 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 I'm afraid you... Yeah, I mean, various other people have described it. I think, <laughs> I think you have to take it to find out. It's a very peculiar experience. I mean, it's a sort of mystical insight. You come back with all sorts of... Uh, <laughs> Profound insights, which turn, turn out to be completely trite and silly when you when you come down, such as that you know. I mean, it doesn't matter whether anyone was there to observe such a beauty. It's enough that it exists, and all that sort of thing. I mean, complete, <laughs> complete mystical nonsense. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Is it fair to say drugs were a, a big feature of extracurricular life? Oh yes. I mean, they were more or less invented in 1964. I mean, nobody really knew anything about drums in 1964, and then they suddenly became very widespread. Can you paint a bit of a picture for us of what your time was like together? What were you dressed like? Well, I, I spent quite a lot of my time hurtling around on a huge motorbike. I mean, Howard never rode a motorbike. In fact, he never rode a bicycle, rather remarkably. He didn't even learn to drive until after he'd left Oxford. But um, we had very long hair. We wore denim jackets and jeans, that sort of thing, you know, <laughs> as one did in the 60s. And what did a night out in Oxford look like? Well, I mean, we spent an awful lot of time in the pub, but I mean, there were also extraordinary sort of garden parties with champagne and, and tents by the river, all the sort of things you'd imagine at that time. I mean, it was a very odd time. I mean, we, we, we had to be back in college by midnight, and if you got back after one o'clock in the morning, you had to climb up a drain pipe to get in. And, and that was just a routine. I mean, one did that sort of mo- most nights. So you knew that drain pipe intimately? Oh, yes. There was a notice on the notice board saying, with gentlemen climbing in on staircase 13, please make less noise. (laughs) (laughs) Something put there by the dean. It was all all quite official. Was he in any clubs at Oxford? I'm hoping you're going to say he was in a school play. Well, he he, he was certainly in a couple of plays. I mean, we did the, um, we did Salome. He was John the Baptist in Salome. I was the stage manager. I got somebody to make a fairly good papier mache head, actually. One of the things that happens in Salome is that John the Baptist has get chopped off. We had a very good head of Howard, but the pack came out, and I had to go to the butchers, pay sixpence for a bag full of fresh blood, which we used to slice up and hang on the bottom of the head so it drip blood when you picked it up. <laughs> he was a natural performer. So he could have been on the front pages of papers for a very different reason. Oh, absolutely. A lot has been made about Howard's ability to talk himself out of tricky situations and his, his amazing charm. Did you ever witness it, and did you ever... Witness him using his charm on, on the ladies. <laughs> All the time, yes. <laughs> Very successfully. <laughs> In those early years, do you remember being charmed by him? Oh, everybody was. The most remarkable, I mean, apart from being very intelligent, his most remarkable quality was he was incredibly funny. I mean, a combination of his fantastic native wit and, of course, the Welsh thing, which he <laughs> laid on with a trial all his life. He was full of extraordinary sort of world witticisms which always seemed much funnier because they were delivered in this extraordinary Welsh accent. I mean, things like, um, there's none so blind as those who can't see and things like that. I mean, it was, you know, it was quite amusing, but seemed much funnier in his accent. Howard's spoken about the class divide that he encountered whilst at Oxford. How do you think it affected him? Well, I didn't, didn't think it affected him. I mean, he, he, just, he just adapted to it. He got on as well with the upper classes as he did with the lower classes. He was extraordinarily sociable and very successful socially. He was completely incapable of being embarrassed. He was a great social success there. And he stayed on, actually. He stayed on for a year after, after he graduated. He started a deep fill in the philosophy of science. And then actually moved to Brighton, where he was going to finish it with the that was when he started becoming a pretty game up to become a, a dope dealer. And that personality he had, that, that winning, charming personality, is that genuinely who he is or is that part of a persona he was creating in order to be able to have the career he had? Well, I mean, that's what he was absolutely consistently. 
with everybody he's dealt with, from Chris Patton to the wicked criminals. He was amoral, not in a repulsive way, in a sort of completely non-judgmental way. He was he was totally cynical. I mean, he didn't he had no no ideals, but at the same time he was completely honourable. I mean, he didn't. I mean, even when he was facing 25 years in prison. I mean, he didn't grass anybody up. I mean, he was a, a very honourable criminal. Moving on from Oxford in 1968, Howard went into teaching. Was that a move that surprised you? Not particularly. I mean, he, he, first of all, he didn't do it for very long. In fact, I took over his job. He was teaching at Brixton College of Further Education. And I was doing an MSc and I was short of money. So I, <laughs> when he gave it up, because he decided that dealing with the was the way he wanted to go. I took it on. I don't think teacher training to cannabis empire is a kind of common pipeline. Did he ever confide in you about the path he was taking at the time? Oh, well, I knew exactly what he was doing, yes. I mean, he, he was completely open about it at every stage. And did you ever try and talk him out of it? No. Why not? Because, I mean, he was, he, that's what he'd chosen to do. It wasn't a... I didn't disapprove particularly. I, mean, I, I was very sorry he did it. I mean, I think it's a, and there's, there's a sense in which his life was a tragedy because he was such a remarkable man. If he'd done anything else, I mean, if he'd been a pop academic, for example, I mean, he'd have been extremely successful. If he'd been a barrister, he'd have been extraordinarily successful. He'd have been successful in anything he did. And I, I thought it was a great shame that he devoted his life to something so silly. Later in life, when he was on the run, Howard would host parties and socialise quite openly. Was he an open book to his friends and to people he trusted? Yes, in, in a sense he was. As I say, he was completely unembarrassed by any situation. He was very straightforward about, well, to me at least, about everything. I mean, including his sort of, you know, his love life, his secret fears and stuff and the other. I mean, he was very open indeed in, in a superficial sense. When you say he was very open about it, how did that manifest? What did you see of that line of work at the time? Well, I, I met a lot of the people he was involved with. I mean, he told me all about what was going on. I remember having a meal with him at a restaurant in, in Brighton, must have been about 1970 or 71, where he got his first, I think it was 28,000 pounds in cash, which in those days was an enormous amount of money. In those days, you could buy a house in London for seven or 8,000 pounds. So I have £28,000 in cash in a cardboard box. It's really remarkable. Did you have to help with any quality control? <laughs> no, no, no. He was, he was very, very capable of that himself. <laughs> <laughs> in 1974, he gets busted for smuggling weed in the speakers of a fictitious rock band. Do you remember the moment when you heard he'd been arrested? Yes. I was very worried for him, obviously. And he got out on bail fairly quickly, actually. He wasn't, he wasn't I can't remember how long he was, he was, he was actually in prison for. And then, of course, I mean, that was one of his first great escapades I've been organising. I mean, the story was that he'd been kidnapped by the, the IRA and that they'd murdered him. And <laughs> goodness knows what. And in fact, it was just, a, as I say, it was just a, a cunning way of jumping bail. The next thing I'm going to say seems so absurd, but after the now infamous incident with the weed in the speakers of the rock band or the so-called rock band, he consequently went on the run. What was it like having your friend on the front page of every newspaper as a fugitive? Well, just remarkable, obviously. I mean, I, I wished him well. I was in touch with him. I mean, we ended the. World Cancer Conference in Florence in 1974, and he was living in a Winnie Baker in the Michelangelo campsite, so we had a word of that for a week in Florence. What impact did Howard being on the run have on his family, in particular his wife, Judy? Well, I mean, he met Judy while he was on the run. She's a remarkable woman, but she was a sort of gangster's mom. She was very young. I mean, she was, I think she was only about 19 at the time. And um, she completely devoted her life to him. I mean, she worshipped him and devoted her life to him and um, was you know, always totally supportive and so on. But I mean, I, I just thought it was rather pretty for a 19-year-old to devote her life to being a, a gangster's mole. I mean, she was a very bright woman 
And that's what she did. I mean, that's what the rest of her life has basically devoted to him. But would she ever reach out to you and say, Julian, you've got to convince him to, to give this all up? He's, he's got to go straight. Oh, God, no. She set her captive absolutely just after he first got on the work. So the idea that she disapproved was ridiculous. Do you think she quite liked it? Well, she chose it. I mean, that's absolutely the life that she chose. But reluctantly? Oh, God, no. As I say, I mean, she went for him. Were there any moments in that period between university and Howard being on the run where your friendship was called into question or was challenged or, or went through any rocky patches? Was it all smooth sailing? Yeah, it was really. I mean, there was no conflict. I mean, we, we were leading such utterly different lives. But we, we saw a lot of each other all the time. We got on very well. So we shared a very happy a social life together and there was, there, was never any, there was never any conflict. And he never asked anything of you that you felt morally compromised by? No, he didn't, luckily. He respected how different we were and how different our lives were, so it wasn't a real problem. I mean, you're obviously a successful man in your own right, but did you ever think, sod all this epidemiology lark, I'm going to go into the drugs trade? <laughs> God, no. <laughs> Not at all. Apart from the I couldn't have done that. I mean, he was, he was extraordinarily courageous. You have to be to lead that sort of life. I couldn't do it there. We, of course, have to talk about Howard's trial at the Old Bailey in 1981. It's probably one of the most mythical parts of his story. Can you tell us what it was like witnessing and experiencing that? We, were you there? I wasn't actually, I didn't actually attend it, but I followed it very closely. And um, it was quite extraordinary. I mean, the funny thing was that there were seven people at charge. Five of them pleaded guilty. And under the judge's rules, they were that the jury weren't allowed to hear their testimony. And so the judge knew for certain that Howard was guilty. Because the judge did see their testimony. But it wasn't allowed to be presented in court. So he had to sit there through weeks of this absolute fraud of lies, which he knew was completely cooked up and then watch the jury quitting him. I mean, in fact, it was a perverse verdict. It's a recognised thing. It's a, it's a recognised function of the jury system that when the jury feels sympathetic to somebody and think that the penalty is excessive, they find them not guilty despite knowing that they're guilty. I mean, it was completely clear that he was guilty. Did you get the sense that he found the trial stressful or was he his usual Howard way about the whole thing? Well, he obviously found it stressful. I mean, he was facing 14 years in prison if he was found guilty. It was much more likely than not that he would be. But he put together this extraordinary defence. It was quite incredible. I mean, he, he got someone to appear and claim to be the deputy head of the Mexican Secret Service to confirm this absurd story. I mean, it was all based on the fact that MI6 had contacted him. And nothing ever came from him. He never actually worked for MI6. But they approached him and asked him if he would because they'd spotted him in Amsterdam. I mean, frequenting some bar where people in the IRA were also around and people were smuggling arms in Britain of the IRA. And Hamilton MacMillan, who was a good friend of his, a bailiff, who was a chap who became an MI6 agent afterwards, I think he recognised Howard and some, they'd, they'd taken a photograph of people coming and going from this place in Amsterdam. And um, he recognised Howard and so he contacted him. And they, they couldn't care less about his drug smuggling. They knew about that, but they weren't interested in that. They thought he'd be a wonderful way of getting sort of inside information on the other people moving in those circles. And Howard, obviously, given the choice between being shot to the customs or saying yes, said yes. And I didn't think he ever did anything. I mean, what, what, what he told me, which I think is true, actually, was that there was one occasion where he was supposed to beat somebody on their behalf and they never turned up. And that was literally it. So, I mean, he never actually did anything for them. But it was true that the contact had occurred. And of course, MI6 denied it initially and then eventually were forced to admit that it was true. And that was it. I mean, you know, he, he was the sort of the James Bond who'd been disowned by the Secret Service and so on and so forth. And that tiny kernel of truth, the whole thing was, was based on that. But he then constructed the most extraordinary defense. I mean, not, not just having this so called deputy head of the Mexican Secret Service confirming it, but that, um, the bloke who ran out of a local pub in the village near Oxford, where I was living. I mean, Leaf, who was also from South Wales and became a great friend of Howard's. While he was on the run, he used to visit us quite often, and he became a great friend of this chap. 
And he appears in the old Bailey and gave Howard an alibi, which is completely fraudulent, but very funny. I mean, that would be <laughs> Lord Hutchinson asked Leaf in the witness box, oh, do you remember where you were on whatever it was? And he said, no wealth will ever forget it. I was lying on the floor under the table in my pub with Mr. Mark, sir. We were laughing because Wales had just beaten France at Cardiff Arms Park, you know. Howard did, did wonderful research when he was putting his defence together. He just worked out there wasn't going to be match in Cardiff Arms Park on that day. <laughs> and so I, I, mean, I can tell this story now because Lee's dead. But I mean, <laughs> so many people perjured themselves at that trial. And the jury knew it. I mean, as I say, the jury knew, knew it perfectly well. He used all his refusals on the jury. He wasn't looking for people in, who did or didn't read the Times or were, were or weren't wise or left wing. He was looking for young women. I think he finished up with eight young women on the jury, and he was a very, very charismatic, attractive man, and he charmed them. That was the aim of the defence, and it worked. In 1988, he gets arrested in Mallorca, and that leads to seven years in prison in America. What was your friendship like during that time? Well, I was the first person who visited him there. There was a federal committee on asbestos, in fact, something I did a lot of work on. And so I was going to America quite regularly to attend this committee, and I'd go on and fly to Chicago and went to a car and drive down to Terry and visit him afterwards. And that was the first visit we had. He'd been in there for about a year, and I went to see him. And later on, of course, I took his children over to see him. What were the conditions like in the prison? Well, it was it was ghastly. It was a, it was a federal penitentiary. I mean, full, full of lifers. I mean, full of murderers and gangsters and you name it. And he he survived there extraordinarily well. I mean, he he was I mean, he was respected by the prisoners because he was such an unusual prisoner. I mean, the fact that he was British, the fact that he was uh, well, he taught. Them. He gave everyone free legal advice. I think he actually got one person's conviction overturned and he got several people's sentences reduced. He had nothing else to do for seven years and he became a real expert on the law. But you didn't get the sense that being inside, in, as you put it, such a ghastly place ever broke his spirit or his resolve? It's very hard to say. I mean, he, he coped with it unbelievably well and he coped with it heroically. But I mean, God knows what it did to him, but I mean, he, he survived it. And when he came out, he lived with us for a few months in 1995 when he came out. He, in fact, he, wrote, he was living well with us when he wrote this to Nice. Did you get any sense from his children how his life decisions, his career decisions had impacted them? I mean, the, the catastrophic thing was that they arrested Judy as well as him which was completely vindictive. I mean, it was fair enough to arrest him, but, I mean, arresting Judy, she was his wife, obviously, so she knew what was going on. But, I mean, she wasn't the sort of active criminal. I think Patrick must have been one and a half at the time. I don't know how old the others were. I says Amber was about 11 and Francesca was about eight, I think. I mean, to have your mother and your father suddenly removed, and they watched it all happen. You know, they were there, and the police broke in and bundled them all off. I mean, that was the appalling thing that the kids suffered. I mean, do you think, as, as well as his own morality, which it sounds like there were positives to, do you think actually fundamentally he was quite selfish? Oh, yes. I mean, certainly. He was very generous with his time. He was very generous socially. I mean, he was very generous financially at various times. I mean, people who were having a hard time. You know, he supported all sorts of people in various ways. But... Um, but did you be some bit selfish, yes. Just thinking about you taking his kids over to see him in prison, I mean, it must have been horrific for them to see their dad in such a place. Yes, but I mean, so they hadn't seen him. I, I can't actually remember what year it was, but they, he'd been in for several years by that time. And he bent over backwards to make it entertaining, to be optimistic about it and so on and so forth. So... I just don't know. I wasn't there. I thought he ought to be alone with them. So I spent two days reading the Bible. It was the only book you were allowed to have in there. You weren't allowed to take a single figure or even a pencil when you went in there. You had to completely empty your pockets. And all we had was the Bible. So I spent two days reading the Bible while they talked to him. Any highlights? Well, it was a, it was a, it was a new one. It was oh, a revised sure. one, which was a, it was a bit of a disappointment. It was very boring. None of the blockbusters. Days. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. 
How did Howard's relationship with his career change over the decades? Well, it was a sort of article of faith, which he, he was always publicly announcing that he had absolutely no regrets. And I just don't know whether that's true. It was his way of <laughs> his survival strategy after he came out in 95. From then on, I mean, that's when he launched from his sort of his, his celebrity career, which I thought was just very boring. He was undoubtedly a thrill seeker. Do you think that the, the fame and the notoriety ticked that box for him? He, he always wanted to be a celebrity. I mean, that was almost the reason that he, he did what he did. Really? When were you first aware of that impulse? Almost forever. That's what he was. And do you think he enjoyed being famous? Oh, yes. I mean, it was, it was, it was his raison d'etre. And what was it about fame that appealed to him? I mean, the money was a necessity. I mean, he had to make a living somehow after 1995. I mean, he, he couldn't really go and be a drug dealer. And that was his income. I mean, writing Mr. Nice was an extraordinary achievement, actually. I mean, he'd never written anything in his life apart from less personal letters. And, I mean, it was virtually unedited. He had an extraordinary talent. I'm fascinated, then, about Howard as a young man. If his motivation was always fame... Could this have gone another way? Could he have been, with his charisma and good looks, a famous actor, a you know, performer of some kind? Could he have been a writer, as you say? He had natural skill there. Could this have all been very different? Oh, yes, absolutely. As I said, we always requested what he chose to do. I mean, I think he was a very remarkable man. He could have led a very different, very successful life. In 2015, he suddenly announced that he had inoperable bowel cancer, how did he tell you about the diagnosis and, and how did he take the news? Well, he was, he was, as always, he was incredibly brave about it. It was obvious he wasn't going to recover. And I went along with him to see the doctor who was treating him on several occasions because I obviously have been involved in cancer research myself, including treatment trials. It's very useful for him to have somebody there who, <laughs> who knew what was going on and could talk to him about it and, and talk to the doctor about it. It was just ghastly. It was a death sentence, and he knew it. And what was his attitude towards treatment? Was he one of those people that just would rather not go through the pain of treatment, or was he prepared to do everything he could to try and get rid of it? He was prepared to do everything he could. I don't think there was ever any question of getting rid of it. It was a matter of controlling it. Since he died, his reputation has been further mythologised, as you might have predicted it would be. This is a kind of question that really only you and a, a few people can answer. What do you think Mr Nice's legacy is? Well, I mean, it's not very different from what it was. When he was I mean, he, he was all his deeds of daring do were, you know, before 1988, really. I'm not sure he was famous for I mean, after he came out, he was famous for being this sort of peculiar old showbiz personality, <laughs> doing these very odd stage shows. I think he conducted one of the... Was it one of the largest drug deals in Europe? It's a pretty substantial legacy. Oh, yes. Yeah, he, he broke the British record three times, I think. I mean, he caught three tons in 1973, or 15 tons in 1981, and uh, God knows how many hundreds of tons he was involved within the, the American deals. But he was acquitted in 1981. The Guardian appeared with the immortal headline, you know, 16 tons, and what do you get? <laughs> But do you think he legitimised certain types of drug dealers? No. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, they're attempting, I mean, they've always been such a romantic films and books about criminals, haven't they? You weren't in the film as a character, the one starring Reese Ifans. Did you feel left out? No. For all the it was about him as a drug dealer, not, not him as a student. Who would have played you, Julian? God knows. <laughs> God, that's the bad. You've got to be ready with that answer because otherwise it's hard to cast them. If you if you ask for it, we can find it for the follow up. Um, and what about the man himself, though? You know, if we're talking about what you remember of him, how would you describe him all these years on? But he was just extraordinarily good company. That was the most remarkable thing about him. He was just always good fun to be with. Very intelligent, very entertaining, very knowledgeable. And very, very funny. Julian, thank you so much. We're very, very grateful. It's really good. So, Alice, 
you already know what I'm going to say, but we have to tell the listeners. We do. Um, I'm not going to be here for a while because I'm going into hospital. I'm, I'll be fine, but I've got a tumour on my spine and it needs to be surgically removed. I know this, there's no easy way to say this. And obviously people are used to us joking at the start of these shows, but I'm deadly serious. So it's serious, but I'll get it sorted and I'll be fine and I'll be back. And in the meantime, the show will continue and you're going to do the show with some fantastic guests. Yes, we'll have some people keeping the seat warm for you. I know that this is a phrase that people say a lot. Obviously, we want you to take all the time you need to recover. Um, but I will miss you so much that I would like you to come back before you're ready. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will miss you too and I will miss making this show. Um, but I, I can't wait to come back. No, honestly, we'll come with a mic wherever you are. OK, see you on the ward. This is the fourth and final episode in our series, The Cannabis King. If you'd like to know more about the story, you can read Mr. Nice by Howard Marks, Hunting Marco Polo by Paul Eddy and Sarah Walden. And you can watch Banged Up Abroad, Season 7, Episode 10, a documentary from National Geographic. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samizdat Audio. This episode was produced by Harriet Wells. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our series producer is Theodora Leloudis for Wondery. Our executive producers are Rich Knight, Jessica Radburn and Marshall Louis for Wondery. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey.